Well, well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the, this installment of the, the MCUBE seminar series. It's my great pleasure to, to introduce Jurgen Stepler, whom, whom I've known for, geez, probably since the mid-late 90s when, when we met at some modeling workshops back over in Europe. Uh, Jurgen got his PhD, and I'm going to not pronounce this properly, Göttingen, in, in 1973. Um, a while ago, um, and he's worked for the uh, German Weather Service from 1973 until 2010, which I think they require one to retire. Yes, that's which right. is not the case here for sure. Um, while he was there, he took a lot, lots of leaves. He was at ECMWF for eight years, from 82 to 90. Uh, he was a UCAR uh, visiting scientist at what was then NMC, but is now NSEP. Uh, shortly after that. Uh, he's visited here a lot. He's been a guest scientist at uh, Florida State University um, and has uh, done a lot of things. Um, most recently, he wrote a book. I, I feel like I'm a talk show host here. Uh, <laughs> Mathematics of the Weather, which is actually coincidentally the title of the, the workshop that we have every uh, year or so, uh, typically over in Europe. And we've been doing that for the last 10 years, and, and Jurgen is the lead organizer of that. Uh, and right now, in his retirement, he still has uh, joint appointments with uh, something that goes by the acronym JEREX, which is essentially the Climate Services Center, which is located in Hamburg, and also the University of Bonn, which he's had an appointment at since his PhD work. So without any uh, further ado, uh, Jurgen is going to talk to us about uh, a number of things, cut cell spherical grids and Galerkin methods and how they're... Uh, best optimized. So your microphone thank you, on. thank you very much. Um, the title may seem complicated, so I offer a simple version of it. So, if you want to know, at the end of the lecture, you should know how to make a model to increase, compared to Eastern WF, the useful forecast time by four days. If you don't know, please ask me, then I was not clear enough. So, um, first of all, I want to thank for uh, this opportunity, not only for the lecture, but also for being here. As it was said, in Germany we have mandatory retirement, and by coming here uh, uh, one month per year, since already a long time, it gives me opportunity uh, to work uh, a lot, and um, um, you see, it's more uh, like a family uh, affair. Uh, here, uh, for example, you see we do in Bad Orb numerical work. Many of the hosts here are seen below, and at the upper right, uh, you see, uh, for example, we have many, many discussions. You, you see uh, Professor um, Dietmar Kröner. He is one of two professors of mathematics in Germany who have an interest in the meteorology. And at that particular, he is there speaking to a student. But at that um, occasion, I asked him if he knew that in his recent project, all methods he used were of first order. And he appeared to know. He even knows very exactly. One version had order 0.8, the other 1.2, and so on. The only thing which uh, I found astonishing, he was not worried at all about this, which I think is an important thing. I mean, it is an important thing to worry about order of approximation. And I hope to show that. Um, you can fall into a lot of traps when getting it wrong. So first, uh, an overview of what I want to talk. Um, the first spherical grid, you see one with hexagonal uh, uh, cells. They are normally done, I think I know no other case, as the cubed sphere and the icosahedron. But there are other possibilities. This is another possibility. Um, you see the, um, the, the range of cell sizes is smaller than you see, for example, with cubed sphere. You see it's just optically. 
And um, so that's a little advantage, but I just took this as an advantage. You can use cubed sphere or any other icosahedron as you want. And all models I know use one grid point per cell. Sometime in the cell, in the, in the center of the hexagon, it can be on a corner or whatever, but it's one point. And the thing I want to point out is using more than one point per cell leads to sparse grids, and the reduction of CPU times achieved there is really worth talking about. It goes from a factor three to a factor 20. And um, to make these, uh, these spare scripts work, you use l galerkin methods. It's about the same as Galerkin methods, but Galerkin methods are not local. They are, have compute an interaction between all points on the globe. And if you work on multiprocessors, that's not really good. Therefore, um, it's changed to l galerkin method, and the most well-known and the most used is the spectral element um, method, which is actually near or actually in operational use. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, cut uh, cells, which have a potential to get the lower boundary right. But there are a number of examples, I don't go into this here, where it goes in the opposite way, which just uh, becomes uh, awful. And then an important point for me is how to achieve it, because uh, I know nearly all my colleagues say, oh, if we have to do something new, like uh, spheric uh, grids, then of course we have to learn something new and we don't want it. Uh, I'm a little bit older and uh, have used spectral method all my life. So I make a point of that you really can do it quite easily by going the right way by, and uh, so I will uh, come to this. So here you see um, grids. This I call the full grid, just to divide it. This here and you get the full grid. You can get three times the grid length, and you get cell structures which are much, much larger. And then you can take more than one point in this larger cell. They are all based on this full grid. And then you get this, and if you want to have to see that in hexagons, you have it here. So these are called the sparse grids. So because not all the grid points of the full grid are used, and there is no computation at all going on, and the computation at the grid points, uh, at the sparse grid points, which rename, is um, not more complicated than usual. It's just uh, like fourth order differencing in the normal way. I want a little dispersion how mathematics can help, old mathematics by Euclid, can help to construct the grids quite easily because you don't need very complicated programs to make a spheric grid. So you are here on a plane. You have four edges, uh, four corners. You connect them, divide the top and bottom equally, and then you create a law of parallels, which everybody knows from high school, says the whole grid is homogeneous. All grid lengths are equal. And the point, which is quite useful for construction, is if you do it in three dimensions, it's all the same. That I call Euclid's limit, because it's Euclid's theorem is valid in three dimensions. So here you take the four edges, you connect the sides, and then you connect again. And what you achieve is a regular grid. 
a regular grid on a bilinear surface. That the grid on the sphere is irregular comes only when you project this thing to the sphere. That grid is finally irregular. And if you want to do numerics on it, we should uh, rather um, take care that uh, we make it uh, correctly for irregular grids, because uh, it is a rather popular game to use um, uh, methods which are valid on regular grids on the sphere, and the sphere has no regular grids. So if you want, from whatever I say, the details, um, for example, the formula, and uh, uh, for example, look at this reference or other reference I had uh, from uh, Harrington. Um, then you can consult uh, this uh, book. And I uh, like this paper of Harrington very much because in my simple word, it says, with spectral elements, you can go all the way from second order polynomials to 50s order or whatever you want. But what he found out by practical calculations with a real realistic model, a real data model, was that it makes not at all sense to go further than polynomial order three. And so all methods which I will discuss, for example, classical U4, MPAS model, and so on, they are all the same in this respect, because they're all derived by polynomial order three. So um, if you want to read it up, then it's, uh, you can use uh, that book. So the efficiency of spherical grids comes by leaving out points from the full grid. The basis is always a full grid. And you leave out points. And from that, it follows there should be a saving of CPU time. And that goes up to a, 20, a factor of 20. So for cubes and rhomboidal grids, um, you are only a factor of 8. If you do the physics correctly, you get 8. But without physics, it's 4. But um, for hexagonal grids in three dimensions, you are supposed to get to a factor 20, but I have not tested it in three dimensions. It's just theoretically from the number of points compared to the number of points of the full grid. And um, for example, if you want to have the fourth order, you can use uh, Voronoi grids, which Ampas does. You can use spectral elements three. It works on rhomboids. And uh, as Harrington found out, that is a thing which makes sense to do. You can use also the l galerkin methods, one of them I call O3, O3. And these are spares. The difference from O3, O3 to SE3 is that they are spares. And you have some potential of uh, uh, saving computer time. So here, I want to demonstrate what spare grid is. I do it for rhomboidal. And um, here is the grid cell in three dimensions. Because with sparseness, it doesn't exist in one dimension. There is some sparseness in two dimension, and in three dimensions, it is uh, really big. So if you imagine you make this grid cell take all of them, you get the full grid, because the next cell above it will have these points, which here are empty. So it gives a full grid if you just collect these. And if you leave these many points out, it's just optical that it's many, you get that grid. And you can do uh, computations on this grid. There are different versions. Um, I prefer the conserving third order version. So on these corner points here, it's, you do use any numerical methods. For example, classical O4. And then 
on the other points, the different uh, equations are a little bit uh, more um, simple. Actually, you are not free to choose them. If you want to assume conservative, the equation of conservation gives you time derivatives for this edge point. When you have already the corner point time derivatives. So that this makes all simple. And here I have done it for, um, if you see, this is a full grid calculation for a linear equation. And this here is uh, uh, the normal, normal O3, O3. And you see it's about a factor 10 lower, even though it's supposed to be only a factor 4. But um, it's a factor 3 lower. And if you take also advantage of the time step, because the time step is marginally higher, the CFL is marginally higher for O3, O3, you get the uh, blue curve. It's only a demonstration. You will probably say we want to see that for a real model, for the real equations, and not uh, for a linear equation. And you are right, and that's the reason, in principle, why I'm here. And now I, hello. <laughs> So help me understand the idea of these sparse grids a bit. I don't quite get it. Uh, you showed on the previous slide the schematic of a cube in the space that has a bunch of points inside of it. Yes. Omit some of those. So is the idea that you've got basis functions that are reconstructing Oh, yes. It field? is basis function, and they are the same, um, the same function space as with spectral elements except that some are left out. The ones which are left out are the very high order ones, because your, if your basic order is 3, you get ninth order polynomials, x to the 3 times y to the 3 times z to the, c, uh, to the 3. And that is a ninth order polynomial, and it's too accurate. So these are left out, and um, I should point out it is not an invention of me. This whole thing is known under the name serendipity grids for classical Galerkin. All I am doing it is transferring it to the L Galerkin. So the idea is to leave out the high order points, the points which will lead to the definition of high order polynomials. Spectral elements can't do it because they rely on a full grid of collocation points, okay. which I don't do. OK, so you're, you're leaving out some of the basis functions yes. relative to what spectral element would keep. And it, does this tie back into your statement at the beginning about the third order being the maximum useful approximation that you can get out of spectral element? That is not my conclusion. That's a conclusion of Harrington. Right, right. But so, so you're saying that then you can actually, basically, you would think you're losing something by omitting some basis functions. But you're saying in practice, you don't lose any axis. That's right. OK. So and I give examples for, for, for that. Um, I have uh, many examples, but I give only one because I think people are interested in hexagonal grids. I have one hexagonal, even though they are a little bit difficult to program, I have one example how it looks, this, this reduction. Um, so now is the point of homogeneous approximation or order. Reasonable are order of approximation two and three. And, and four. And that homogeneous order means that this order of approximation is at every grid point. If you go to a collocation grid, at every grid point. And if you have one omission, that's a catastrophe. Uh, there are not many publications about it. I mean, Joe and I did one, and the other Japanese people did one. You can see awful results, and all are that you have to have this um, uh, homogeneous approximation order. And if you have this Elgalerkin method, whatever, being spectral elements or the ones I propose, 
um, they have this, um, due to the choice of high order basis functions, they have the homogeneous order two or three. So the noise is really spectacular, which comes uh, out. I think I will have an example uh, later. And uh, that's really good. And then I come to the, uh, yes, to the, uh, um, to the cut cells. So at one of our seminars, Christopher Payne said the triangular meshes, if they represent a mountain, are automatically cut cell, which is true, no doubt about that. And uh, he gets a good approximation uh, because uh, uh, classical Galerkin is essentially a least square method to compute the, um, to the time derivatives. But it is not good enough because I believed it myself uh, long enough because I think uh, classical Galerkin is such a wonderful thing, it must be of an increased approximation order. That is true if the grid is regular. But if the grid is irregular, the classical Galerkin with first order basis function will not give you um, uh, uh, better than first order accuracy. And I'm always interested in the practical relevance of it. I try now to find someone together with me to find an example of it. Um, but here we are. We have a rather regular grid. But when the mountain comes, there are irregular cells appearing. The irregular cells are a not regular grid. And the classical Galerkin, which Christopher Payne is using, um, becomes not accurate. And um, the solution is um, to go to higher order basis function spaces, such as those used with spectral elements. Um, why with classical Alerkin nobody uses it, but there are textbooks of the 1970s which say, if you use it, you have the spare grids. And they explain it, but nobody used it. Everybody used this classical Galerkin with, I have no idea why they are doing it. Perhaps I think the other is too complicated, but that's not the case in my mind. For, it's not the case, and it's anyway no excuse. It's no excuse to be, because it's a little bit simpler to, to make a huge error. Um, so it reverts to first order. That is the message I have, and one should do something about this. So we have a number of these uh, models with classical Galerkin and other methods, uh, finite volumes, and so on. They use uh, 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 cut cells with an adaptive mesh. And my suspicion is, and I hope I can find the computer programming power to, 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 to put light on it. My suspicion is that um, I was even an author of some of these test calculations for the fluidity model. And um, I always tried my main author to, to meet more experiments. And he did, and they were in, in the end not finding the way in the final paper. <laughs> but um, I think there is a possibility that the adaptive version of cut cells adapt essentially to errors, to errors of a noise generating boundary. Yes, I have the noise generating boundary. That is from a paper I did with Joe some time ago. That's pure advection. It's really not a very complicated equation, not a nasty situation, because you see the mountain is a straight line. And there is um, its passive attraction. And uh, there is uh, this feature moving along the mountains. And you can easily see um, 
some of the versions look rather noisy. And you can have also a solution for it. So that is an example from an ex of an external noise generating boundary. And it's not because the boundary is curved or anything. The no boundary couldn't be nicer than this. So that uh, possibility exists. And um, we should get over about this. I mean, we should get a cartel method without the noise generating boundary. So one of the thing is to keep an order of approximation, which is, if you want it for, for at every point. This is, again, a very simple example. It is a one dimensional, again, homogeneous attraction, but very small scale. It's a one, one peak structure. It has only different from zero at one point, and it moves happily along. And here, the resolution gets, um, is doubled. So this is a regular case, but here, the resolution is, is doubled sometimes. And when the structure reaches the, the, the place where the resolution doubles, it um, a reflection of computational nodes, which are quite big, comes. Of course, in regular grids, that doesn't happen. But in irregular grid, if you do it correctly, that means you modify the fourth order differencing scheme to be correct for irregular meshes, you also have uh, no reflection. And I remember in Cambridge, we uh, saw the same thing for more complicated equation on the sphere uh, by the spectral element people, both from NCA and uh, from Monterey. And they showed the same thing. You can have a one to two grid refinement without any problems. And this point, spectral elements do right, and they had the same thing uh, in a less simple situation. This is another thing to point out uh, the situation. The round points are um, regular resolution, again, advection, and you see fourth order convergence because we are using the fourth order formula. Then the grid is changed in an irregular way. It's on average the same grid length, but it's added and uh, stochastically added and subtracted something. And you go from this line to this with a square. And that's, of course, an enormous loss of accuracy. And this is a kind of thing which many people using uh, 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 finite volumes encounter. And their solution is always change the grid to be not so irregular, if necessary, just a little bit irregular. But another solution is that you see with the rhomboids, that you just use, make the differentiation right. There is a differentiation which is accurate on irregular grids in fourth order, and that doesn't bring you in danger of losing all your uh, accuracy. I found this formula occasionally in the literature of CFD, never in meteorology, and the CFD people didn't say how they did it. They just say they make the order consistent attraction with correct weights. How they computed the weight, nobody said to us, but if you go to the server, which I have, there is a program to compute the weights. So, if, uh, so, so I, this is what uh, I, I said. Uh, so the finite volume method is very popular, and the version people are using makes them often fall into this particular trap. That all of a sudden they see huge inaccuracy. And by the way, the first global 
um, uh, glo glo global uh, uh, mesh, spherical mesh, used by John Baumgartner, it had it right. It had correct, homogeneous, second order accuracy. And this model, of course, is further developed. In the further developments, it's no longer there. And if you read all the papers they wrote about it, that they saw enormous noise and did all kind of tricks of getting rid of the noise again. But uh, one other idea would be just to, um, to, to use the formula which are correct for irregular grids. So classical Galerkin is OK if the basis function are of third order. l Galerkin is also OK, but it has advantage over classical uh, that it doesn't have global communication, which I think is an advantage we now need. And um, so spectral elements are not spares, and the ones I propose are, in addition, spares. So uh, that is. So classical Legalerkin and the ones uh, I propose using spares grid save computation time, I have, we had that already. So to get, get to fourth order, you can use uh, Voronoi grids, you can use the Legalerkin method. O3, O3, that propose I, or uh, spectral elements of order three. And they go to approximation order four. And classical Galerkin, you can have two choices. Either you use uh, linear elements, and the grid must be regular, and you have fourth order. Or the, with classical Galerkin use irregular, then you have to use basis uh, functions, which are um, basis function which are of third order also. So it can be saved. So second order finite volumes. They also go to first order. But also second order can be modified to be correct on irregular grids. It's just that instead of two weights, which are both one half, you use three waves, weights which sum up to one, but are not one half anymore. And classical fourth order can also be changed. To, um, uh, to be accurate on irregular grids. You just must do it. It is not complicated. You just must get the weights. And for people who think it was is a bit nasty to compute all the weights, I have a solution also. And the classical of war is, of course, not conserving. And I don't see, well, it can be made conserving if you make the spare grids then it can be made uh, conserving. And so here are the grids on the sphere. To the lower left, you see the numbers, which are the indices on the, for the full grid. Above it are the indices of the corners and of the patches. So in this particular T, um, T33, uh, you have 18 patches, and they have double indices. So when you implement such a method, you have a lot of indices. Four for the grid points, uh, and then another uh, two for the grid points, and another two for the, um, for the patches. And if you have uh, um, uh, spare grids, you get a, a pointer index to, to get it all um, uh, without, uh, you, you want to store it uh, uh, compactly. You want to have a compact storage without holes in the, in the storage. Uh, and here you have the same thing for hexagons. So 
Imagine the full grid, which you have seen before. And then you have for the hexagon um, the spares points. The center is not a spares point. The center is just for administration. And if you repeat this pattern here, 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 you get the full grid you see on the right. Not the full grid, you get a hexagonal grid on the right. And you see just optically that the number of points you save is enormous. And here I think you would like to see how a field looks if you represent it in a hexagonal grid. So I have it only on the plane, not on the sphere, but it's not very different. And this is a paper where finally we wrote to the editor, we can't produce more results because that way we programmed it is too complicated. We just can't manage to do it. Well, it needs to be a new approach. I think now I know the approach. It needs pointers associated with the hexagons. And um, what you see is a structure moving from here to here and back again, forward and backward. If you are very near, which you are not, you see that you are not using all the points. It's enlarged down, uh, downwards and you see, together with, um, with the hexagonal grids. You are not using all the points. S only the points on the, on the corners and edges are amplitudes. The other ones are not moves. That appears as if something remains back. And if you look at uh, this, it is enlarged here. So that's how the amplitudes uh, look. And the ones which are not used are put to zero. So you need some time to see how this structure comes out. But if you move it back, this structure and that combine to give that what you see in the lower right. So the accuracy remains there. And you just use very little points. And of course, you can use here interpolation. Then you see the field in the normal way. But you mustn't. There are these, these points which are unused. If you give them any amplitude, the method will work OK. And it, it looks as if. Part of the structure moves out, it moves bit, back and combines again with it. So how does the spectral space look? I have now shown only the collocation space, grid points. And it is much simpler than other spectral spaces because the corner points are both grid points and spectral coefficients. That's the same. There is no transformation at corner points, which makes it easier for the computer. For the edge points, there are derivatives, second and third derivatives in z, in y, and in x. They are stored. That are the spectral coefficients. And that means if you do a spectral transform, and there are no amplitudes and no spectral coefficients associated with the interior of the volume and not even with the surfaces. So if you do a transform, it just involves two grid points and two spectral coefficients. They transform into each other, very local. And that's a big difference to the spectral method of ECMWF, because ECMWF uh, has huge volumes of data uh, which need to be added. And uh, they are very proud of having this addition very efficient. But if you look into the computer, make statistic of it, 
in a typical spectral model, a lot of zeros are, zeros are added. Most of the numbers which are there are zeros. And all we are doing here is having less zeros. And uh, rather using only uh, values which uh, have uh, not uh, zero. So this is the same thing for the hexagon in a plane. So here the corner amplitudes and the edge amplitudes, and there are two spectral coefficients, and of course two um, collocation uh, points there. So uh, the summary is, if you think of doing further developments, I think the M plus numerics being fourth order is just right. It's, um, Voltaire would say it's the best of all worlds in this respect. Um, the only thing is, uh, if you want to improve it, the efficiency can be improved because you can go to spare grids and they would not improve the, 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 the efficiency by a little bit. They would improve it enormously because um, uh, similar Grange uh, people were working for 20 years of making the model uh, by a factor three faster, and we are speaking here about a factor uh, 20 in uh, three dimensions. So that's a possibility. But the lower boundary condition is another, um, uh, uh, is another concern. As you have um, uh, uh, noise generating surfaces in the interior, which are caused by a lack of approximation order, at the surfaces, you also have it. And the terrain following transformation is, I, I make now this, this kind of logical point, I like this so much, like uh, I like uh, Euclid's uh, geometry. There is an approximation condition, which is normally neglected. The reason of neglection is that if you neglect that condition, forecasts become much better. And there is nothing to argue against this. But the orography representation by this can only take in favor of its argument that the results are better. In this way, it becomes a parametrization and not a discretization. So if you do the same by introducing the number 3 for pi, then, of course, it doesn't matter how many cases you do. You won't prove the value of pi by investigating the accuracy of a model. That is a priori known that one of the version is better. So here, the orography, how it is in nearly all models uh, represented, is a parametrization. Its only argument is that you get um, that you get better results by what you are doing. So um, the cut cells are different. Oh. I have a little. I have a little feature here about uh, that comes later. The cut cells. That is, I was a little bit speaking about the, um, about the cut cells, but the cut cells come later. First, I want to make a point about spherical grids. They are not a huge project. If you want to do them, you don't need to worry how to draw all these lines on the sphere. You can have it done by someone who has done it once. You store them, and you get so-called geometric files. And these geometric files can include the differentiation weights. So after you do that, you're, I'm assuming you are using um, a structured grids. So the structured grid differentiation looks the same. Just you take your geometric files, take the weights from there. So 
I or anybody else could publish a program which is only half a page long, which does a divergent. In order that that program runs, you need about 20 uh, geometric files, which must come from somewhere. They could be stored in the internet for some research examples. And then you can have this rather easily. And I did it this way. Because some time ago, I met uh, Mark Taylor. And um, he had the home model. And we wanted to try that out. The question was if spare grids give the same results as spectral elements, which use the full grid. Uh, all we did uh, was that I produced a few uh, subroutines and a few tables and so on. I gave it to him, and he ran the cases in, uh, in the home model. And we got these results for accuracy. So the red is the sparse uh, grid. It's not so accurate, but there is a reason for it. Because when we look more carefully in it, it doesn't have the res resolution it appears to have. So there is a little error to be solved. So if you adjust for this, you just shift it by two thirds of a, of a grid length, and then you these uh, coin, uh, coincide. Um, and you are still a saving. You are still sparse, not so sparse as originally thought. But it is uh, essentially by doubling the resolution, not uh, having three times the resolution. And the error is pointed out here. So this is a dispersion diagram. A wonderful line is this one here. It goes all, all, uh, only to here. This black uh, line is a curve of uh, the spectral elements. And that, of course, looks wonderful. But as we discussed with the reviewers, it was not actually we, we came on it. It was all done by a reviewer. And um, we still said that is our curve here of the third order, which I used uh, with Mark Taylor. You see, it has a huge uh, a, a null space, which is not bad. You can run with it. But it means that it has not all the resolution. It has only 2 thirds of the resolution we, we thought of it. So that's a problem to be solved. Uh, but we argued that the O3, O3 method is still better because there is this wiggling. And about this wiggling, there is a whole literature you need to put in smoothing and so on with spectral elements. So the red curve, it's the second order spectral uh, SO2O3. It looks rather good. And neither O2O3 nor O3O3 have this wiggling the spectral wiggling there. And therefore, we still are better than this wonderful looking spectral, uh, uh, spectral element three. But I think this curve here points to an error. And I think I know how to solve that error. But it all needs to be done. So a few words on uh, cut cells. So, we have a cut cell version. I think it was the only cut cell version which worked with real uh, files, but we don't like to uh, develop it further. So if we do it, and it was done in three dimension and inside uh, the MM5 model. It was never tested in standalone without diffusion or anything. Uh, MM5 lose, used a lot of diffusion, so we don't know what diffusion does to it or not. But uh, what it does is that uh, here, with the Terran following version, which was the MM5 essentially, our version of it, you get enormous, you, you have to read this here, you get enormous vertical velocities in a situation which is stably stratified. If you look downscale, the radiation was switched on. It is a real model. We, we didn't have anything else in the real model. The radiation switched on, then 
uh, valley and, and, and mountain uh, winds appeared and um, the amplitudes are just rise very, very small in c compared to the above. And here another example, a low over France, and this is one of a hundred cases, a low over France against with the MM5 model to the left and spectral element uh, and uh, Katzel version to the right. And note, for example, the very nicely looking um, uh, bend of uh, vertical velocity, which has accidentally the right amplitude, which is in the order of some centimeters per uh, second, while the amplitudes are there much too much. And you, I mean, our forecasters get these forecasts, these, these fields all the time, and they up to now refuse to look at them to the left one. This is the precipitation forecast also. In the top row, you see it's oscillating, and the lower row makes much more uh, sense, I guess. And here, just shortly, six-day forecast of the vertical velocity. They are uh, lower right, totally messed up. But and after five days over the Atlantic, and um, the cut cells have much more similarity there. But uh, this is a vertical, uh, the vertical, the, the v-velocity component. So the lows are correct, both. Both forecasts are correct. I think after six days, um, uh, these are lower two. The left one is uh, the cut cells. After six days, there is no relevant difference. I mean, the, um, the velocity, the, the low goes a little bit, uh, um, not so high as Iceland and here higher. That is a little difference. But if you live in Iceland, that is a forecasters rather want to make that difference <laughs> between North and South Iceland. Uh, so, but it is essentially the same, but the differences become huge if you look after 10 days. And we had a number of six forecasts of it. And um, I think the um, cut cells were consistently better. I mean, here, the, the one made two lows of it, of it, where in reality there was only one. And all these kind of things we had, there were huge difference. And I think from this, I find that uh, to use the cut cells, it would um, uh, uh, would give, give big promises on uh, long range, longer range forecasts. So the new uh, model, um, we have it in second and fourth order. And this is second order. Order that is more classical uh, with um, with staggered grids, and you see here is a mountain passive advection. It goes just up this mountain shape without any problem. You can uh, what the lower is. I don't uh, explain. So that works nice for passive advection. So here we are at fourth order. We come to the point where I have no. I think with high order is the thing we need. Because in, we need the high order, the fourth order we need. And uh, this is a structure I have written a little paper, not for publishing, but uh, for Joe and Bill. How it is done. We need only amplitudes here. And it can, they can be computed in, an, uh, in a one-dimensional way. Because the fluxes vertical to it are zero, at least for the advection terms. There is an exception uh, for the pressure gradient. And then we need to expand it to this point near to he, here. That can be done order consistent. And that's, I think, the thing I would prefer to work on it because the second order is not really good. We need the fourth order alone for the reason that 
fourth order is okay for, um, uh, for large eddies and that not. So my suggestion is to do the small earth to test CPU efficiently. Use Joe's mountain to test cut cells. The aim is to get uh, <laughs> the mountain generated noise, uh, uh, the, the surface generated noise out of it. So my conclusion is uh, that um, the spare grid offers a substantial advantages of computer time as compared to the MPAS, not for accuracy. They are both just right in accuracy, to my mind. Um, for LES, which we will want to have some time, fourth order is just necessary. And the cut cells offer increase of forecast quality. And I think I have 20 of arguments that the order four did not materialize in forecast scores. But um, I think the reason is bad surface boundary conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jürgen. We have time for just a few questions here. Um, does anyone have one? Um, yeah, our technology is such a must have one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in an MPI code, um, what typically happens in a traditional code is uh, one processor has to exchange its boundary information with another processor. And what you're doing, does it have to do that? Or how many points have to be actually uh, transferred between uh, two processors in the way that you've laid it out? This transport is just the same as it would be for classical force order differencing. That means a maximum of two rows to be exchanged or interpolated or how you want it. The maximum is two. But there are special kind of things where just one row because you can compute one-sided differences on the sides and you need only to exchange the one-sided differences, which essentially is only one row. Yeah, the, the big code NEC 5000, they, uh, they just exchange one row. And uh, it, if you run big, it really makes a difference, uh, the actual transposing of data between the two processes. I was just, like I said, I was just curious how, yes. what the, what that, how that works in your code. Any other, any other questions here? I, we're at 3 o'clock. Uh, Jürgen's here for another week and a half until the 30th of April. Yes. So, and he's right across from my office, up in uh, FL3. Um, so if you want to speak with him more about all this, or take a look at his book or stuff, please, please stop on up. And we'll be out here for a little while longer too. So let's thank our speaker again. And...